Hello and welcome. Here in Chicago, spring is in the air. I'm wearing pink and God has an exciting message from his word for us today. It's about freedom. Freedom is defined as the act or right to be able to act, speak, or think however one wants without hindrance of any kind. We place a high value on freedom. I think back to war wars that we have experienced in this world and people who have gone to great lengths, great sacrifices, and have endured great cost for the sake of freedom because we value freedom. I think about animals and pertaining to, to zoos. I, I live close to the Lincoln Park Zoo and we can, we can go there for free. But if you want to go see animals out in the wild, go to a safari, that's going to cost you thousands of dollars. Why? Because we place a high value on freedom. Here in this day that we live in now, we're, we're quarantined and we can't go necessarily where we want to go. We, we might not even have a specific place that we want to go visit. It's just the fact that we want to have the freedom to go wherever it is that we wish. Why? Because we place a high value on freedom. But these are all freedoms pertaining to, to physical dimensions. What is true freedom? And let me ask you this. Are you living today in the ultimate freedom? That's the question that the Apostle Paul addresses to his readers. It's the question that he indirectly is addressing to us today. Are you living today for that, with that ultimate freedom that our souls long for the most? So to answer that question, if you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it. We'll be in Colossians chapter 2 in verses 13 through 15. And, and while you're turning there, obviously, let me give you some context and some background before we just dive into the text. The book of Colossians was, as I said, written by the Apostle Paul from prison in Rome. And he was writing to the church in Colossae. Now, Colossae, if it's uh, in the modern day Turkey, and so Paul was in Rome, so that's pretty far away. And, and Paul, as far as we know, never even had been in Colossae. So Colossae was the church that was founded by a man named Epaphras. Now, Epaphras was a convert of Paul, and then some troubling things had started arising in the church. Some false teachings had started to weave into the truths of God's word. And so Epaphras, troubled, went to visit Paul in Rome. I looked on Google Maps and from Colossae to Rome today, walking and by boat would take 11 days. Now imagine 2,000 years ago. I can only imagine how long it would have taken. It was an exhaustive and tiring journey, I can imagine, and at great risk. So Epaphras, when he got to Rome, actually ended up staying in Rome because he too was imprisoned with Paul. And so someone else had to take the message back, but it was an important message. And so it got back. See, the main issue in the church of Colossae was that these believers, these followers of Christ, were trusted in Christ for salvation, but they were placing Jesus alongside these other gods, along these other idols, as if their life was okay, and then they just took Jesus and added it alongside their life. See, the church in Colossae is not too far off from much of our world today. If we're not careful, we can easily do the same thing in placing Jesus alongside other things in our lives and placing him in similar value. And so this word, man, it strikes us 
right where it needs to. And it's totally applicable to our lives here today. So in Colossians chapter 2, Paul is talking about Jesus being the the head, the, the one that we are to submit to, the one who, when we identify with, and we are subject to him, he is the one who is over us all. He is the one. And displayed in baptism, in the text right before, about how when we identify with him in his death, we also are able to identify with him in the resurrection. And so Paul, saying those good truths, giving us that picture, that broad understanding now in verse 13 goes deeper and gives us even more light into what he was talking about to understand it even more. So, Paul, to the Christians in Colossae, and now to us today, verse 13, the word of God, he says, And you, who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Oh, isn't this a good word? This is good news. So many truths about who God is and what he has done for us through Christ. And so that's where we're going today. This passage gives us four truths about freedom that God displays through Christ. But before we can get to the good news, we must understand the bad news. Before we can realize who we are with Christ, we must realize who we were without Christ. And that's truth number one. God declares us spiritually dead without Christ. That's what Paul says in verse 13. He says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You were dead. Do you believe that? You were dead? Maybe not physically, but spiritually, yes. And Paul gives two evidences against the Colossians. So he says, your trespasses and then the uncircumcision of your flesh. Let me explain each of those just just a little bit. I'm going to start with the the second one just because it's a little bit less relatable for us today. He says, the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now, at first I thought, what is this talking about? You know, the circumcision of the heart, you know, where we were not... We didn't have the heart of Christ, and so then he circumcised our heart. That's actually not it, because just before this, in verse 11, he he tells the Colossians that you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. So that's the circumcision of the heart. He tells the Colossians that, like, literally, they were uncircumcised. And the reason he says that is because the Colossians were, they were made up of a multi-ethnic group of people. See, Colossae was alongside a trade route, and so there was a wide variety of groups of people living in that town. There were were some Jewish Christians, but many were non-Jews, most even, who believed a number of different things before following Jesus, dealing with things such as uh, asceticism and animism and astrology and just all kinds of different things. If it was around in that day, it was in Colossae. And so Paul is saying, and, and the Colossians would have known this to be true. Paul's saying, remember, like remember you were dead to God because of the uncircumcision of your flesh. See, we need to realize what circumcision is and, and what it was. So in the Old Testament, it was the sign of of the covenant that God gave to his people. His people, the Jews, the people of Israel, were to circumcise their males as a symbol to show that they belonged to the family 
of God. Similar in how, a little bit how we have a last name to show what family we are connected to. Circumcision was designed to show who God's people were. And so to distinguish themselves between them as the Jews and then the pagans of the world. And so Paul is reminding them, you were uncircumcised. You didn't belong to the family of God. You didn't have the badge, the physical representation that pointed to a spiritual reality. They were alienated from God. But not only that, he also says that they were dead in their trespasses. We can relate more to this one, right? So trespasses, it's talking about just our sins, all the things that we've done to disobey God. But I love the word trespasses. It gives us a good visual, doesn't it? So trespass, to go somewhere where you're not supposed to go, to step over the boundary, to go from where you are supposed to, what you're supposed to do, what God allows for us and then stepping over and doing what God says we're not to do. We're all guilty. We've all done things that we weren't supposed to do, gone where we shouldn't go and thought things that we should not think. Things that are in direct rebellion to the God who created us. As I was thinking as you know, have, have you ever gone somewhere that you weren't supposed to go? I remember a story back in my high school days. So I was in a high school class, second semester, all seniors. So yeah, as you can imagine, we got a lot of work done in that class. <laughs> but what I remember most was that off to the side, there was a window. You see, we were on the top floor of the building. So we could see the roof, actually, of the building just off to the side. And I don't know how it got there, but one day I saw a soccer ball was out there. I was like, man, somebody must have had a big leg, huh? And, and see, I was a soccer player in high school, so, you know, it was just kind of intriguing. I was like, oh, man, I kind of, kind of wish I had that soccer ball. I wish I could just kind of go grab it. But, I mean, obviously it's on the roof, right? So not really an option. But just for fun, I, you know, one day I, I, I saw and I asked the teacher, hey, you know, can I go on the roof to, you know, just grab the soccer ball? teacher looked at me no <laughs> absolutely not you, you can't go on the roof of course I, I, I was a man who was persistent so uh, next day I'd raise my hand hey can you is it okay if I go on the roof to, to get the soccer ball and, and again no and it kind of became a joke in our class you know some days I won't even say anything I would just raise my eyebrows and point And every day I get the shake of the head. No. But one day we had a substitute teacher. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm a man of faithful tradition. So just like any other day, I raised my hand and I said, Hey, could I go get the soccer ball off the roof? Substitute teacher didn't realize it was a joke. And he said, yeah, sure, you know, in, in, in a little bit. What? Oh boy. I, I felt like a little kid who, who, whose mom finally told him that he could have dessert before dinner. Like, I'm, like he knows that he's not supposed to, but, but mom said yes, yeah, so... Uh, all right, I guess, I guess, let's do it. There's no turning back now. And sure enough, later on in the class, teacher said, all right, go ahead, that's fine. I still can't believe it. My eyes are wide open. My jaw still on the floor. So I walk on over to the window. I open the window. And I step out. Step over the boundary from the classroom onto the roof. I hurry over and go get the soccer ball. Bring it right back. And oh man, what a moment. I knew. And now the, the proud owner of an extremely flat soccer ball... <laughs> But more importantly, I had just been on the roof. Like, how cool is that? It's amazing. No harm, no foul. Except, little did I know, 
that someone in the class had taken a video of the whole ordeal. Yeah, not good. So sure enough, the next day, the normal teacher returns. And after class, he brings me to his desk and confronts me with the reality of what had happened the day before. And he pronounces me guilty based off of the evidence that he had received. Now, I tell you that lighthearted story in good fun to paint a picture of a much, much more serious reality that we all find ourselves in. That we all have overstepped the boundary of what God says is okay. And we all find ourselves guilty before God, who knows all things. He's seen the tape. And we're all guilty before him. And so what we must do is not deceive ourselves, but acknowledge our desperate position before God. That unless God intervenes, we are in big trouble. We're on a path that, as Paul says, leads to death. But let me ask you this. Do you know? What, what did God do? What did God do for the Colossians in this letter and what did he do for you and me that we might not no longer be dead in our trespasses see god yes declares us spiritually dead without christ that's truth number one but truth number two god gives us life with christ he did it he, he continues on he says and you God made alive together with him, having forgiven us our, all our trespasses. See, Jesus rose from the dead and had life, and it says that God made us alive together with Christ. He frees us from the, the meaningless life. He frees us from the sin, the trespasses that had been holding us down. And notice the way that it's phrased. It says, God made alive. God made you alive. Christian, if you are alive right now in Christ, praise God. But realize this, it has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you've done. Nothing to do with who you are. Nothing to do with what you will do in the future. No, God alone is worthy of giving us life. He's the one who gave us life in the beginning, who knitted us together in our mother's womb. And he's the one who makes us born again in Christ. Give him all the praise. And how did he do that? He did it by forgiving us all our trespasses. So that which was binding us, that which was holding us, Dead spiritually, he forgave it, and in doing so, freeing us from the sin that we had. I think about a, a story about, uh, imagine being in the middle of the ocean right now. A nice, warm summer day, just a beautiful blue waves calmly surrounding you. Maybe you, wish that, maybe you wish you were there right now. But the good news ends quickly. Because you realize that the only reason that you are alive right now is because of the single plank that you're holding on to. And you look around and you cannot see a thing besides water. It's just ocean and ocean and ocean. Reality sets in that it is no longer a question of if you will die, it's a question of when. There's no hope. It's not looking good for you. But then, 
with one night, your eyes are closed and you're awakened to the sound. It's blaring. And then it's a sight, a light just coming right at you. And you realize it's a ship coming your way. What's going on? You didn't even realize that anybody was out looking for you. And yet, now, in this moment, the captain of the ship comes up to you, pulls you out of the water, and he says, I found you. What a miracle. That's unbelievable. You had no idea that anyone was looking for you, and now here you have been found. You were as sure as dead, but now you are alive. Friends, that is the good news of the gospel, that we in our sin did not even know that we're headed down a path that leads to destruction. We're on our way to die spiritually. If we die in... We, if we die in no relationship with God, we'll spend eternity without relationship with God. But he did something about it. Jesus, the good shepherd, goes after and finds his sheep. And that, if you're a Christian, that's what God did for you. He did it. He came and brought you from death to life. God made us alive in Christ. And why does that matter? I think it matters because it, it does have an impact on the way we live our lives. See, if we feel like we somehow bring something to the table, like we're saved because, yes, we're saved because Jesus on the cross, but come on, like, I'm also a pretty good person. So, like, no. No. It gives us this false reality that somehow we're deserving of the life that God gave us. And what it does is it minimizes our worship of Christ. When we realize how desperate we are for Him, it raises our worship for Him. And so let me ask you this. What is it that you are worshiping? And sure, if you've been to church for much time, you know the answer is Jesus. But is that true? Like really, is, is that what occupies your mind the most? Is who or what do you think about when you lay your head on your pillow at night? Who or what is the first thing that you think about in the morning? I challenge you. How often are you thinking about Christ? How often are you thinking about living your life for Christ? Or are you living your life for yourself? I challenge you to say today in a fresh way, Jesus, you are my life. Whatever you want to do with my life, it belongs to you. And all oh, the freedom that we have in that. So realizing that our dependence is on God because he declares us spiritually dead without Christ, but then he gives us life with Christ. But the question is, how? How did he give us life? Oh, well, he forgave us our trespasses. Well, how did he do that? Keep reading in verse 14. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And that is truth number three. God's gift is final because of Christ. God's gift is final because of Christ. It's not about what we do now. So God made us alive. And it's not about if we are able to hold that standard, if we're able to keep that life. No, it's final. The gift is final because Christ was the one who gave it. Christ was the one who paid it. It's not about our performance now. We can be freed from trying to hold our standing before God. Paul gives us a helpful illustration here to give us clearly an understanding of 
What's going on here? So he forgives us, not just by sweeping it under the rug. No, God is a just God. When there's a crime that's been committed, a penalty must be paid. And so it's either us eternally in hell or what? Is, is there another option? Yes, God gives us the, the other option here in Christ. And he does it, he says, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. What, what does that mean? So, obviously we know when there's a crime committed, it must be paid for. And so, the law itself is good. It's for our good. But the, the, when we disobey the law, then it's against us. It's kind of natural. That's just the way things work. We do things wrong, and then there's debt that we have to pay for. And so that's what's standing against us. And we have so much debt that there's, some, there's nothing that we can do. We rebel God all the time in the things that we say, do, and think. God is holy, and we are not. And again, it's not about doing more good things than bad things. A judge doesn't doesn't judge based off of your good deeds. You can't say, well, yes, I stole this money, but look at all the good things I've done. doesn't matter. You're judged based off of the crimes you commit. And so those crimes and the debt is what stands against us. And it's that that Paul says that God set that aside, that debt that we had, he set it aside and didn't just sweep it under the rug. No, God delivered justice and he did so by placing it on Christ whom he placed on the cross. And how does that work? Because Jesus was the perfect man the per and God himself. See, Jesus had no sin to die. He had no debt to pay. And yet he willingly became the perfect sacrifice on our behalf, paying that debt in our place. That's what happened on the cross. Jesus in our place. One way that I've thought about this recently, if, if you, um, there's a, a new YouTube show that John Krasinski has been putting on in recent weeks in light of the quarantine and kind of the, the sad mood that is in the world that we live in now. He created this YouTube show called Some Good News. And so just a, some uplifting stories to brighten people's moods. And a couple weeks back, maybe you saw this, he had a young girl on the show with him. And the reason was, was because she was incredibly sad. See, she had tickets to go see the movie Hamilton. Now, if you know anything about the music world at all, you know that Hamilton is just the big thing. Like, it costs a pretty petty to go to Hamilton because it's amazing. My wife wants to go, wanted to go so bad. And this girl had tickets. She was going to go. But then, of course, they were all canceled because of all the social gathering requirements. And so here she is talking with John, and he's trying to cheer her up. And, and she's, she's thankful, you know, but obviously very sad that she didn't get to see the musical. And then, just like out of nowhere, like the director of Hamilton, the star cast member, shows up on the screen and starts singing her favorite song from Hamilton. Just like, what? Just like blown away. And, and then before we know it, a couple other cast members start to chime in to add to the song. And, and soon the whole screen is filled with a dozen of the cast members giving this girl this private live individual performance and she is just beside herself cannot believe what is happening and so she she just sits there and just enjoys it and she receives the amazing gift that was given to her and so what she 
What she didn't do, she obviously did not deserve this. She didn't deserve it. But it was just this amazing gift that she received. And what she didn't say was sit there and say, oh wow, thank you, that was amazing. Now, um, let me ask you this. How much, how much do I owe you? Like, I, I only got like a, a buck 25 in my piggy bank over here. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll write you an IO, IOU. You know, don't, don't worry about it. Just, just let me know and, and I'll get it. I'll get it to you. Okay? No. Oh, God, she, did, she didn't say that. That'd be ridiculous, right? We know that would make no sense. Friends, can I ask you a question? How many times do we try to think as if we can somehow repay God for the amazing gift that he has given us in Christ? And we may not admit that blunt, as bluntly as that. But how often do we make mistakes and we think, oh, I'll make it up to you, God. Or... Yes, God, oh, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard to, to, to show that, that you did a good thing, that, that it was worth you dying for me. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you back, or at least some of it. Friends, that makes no sense. Stop going to the cross and trying to take the debt back for you to pay. No, go to the cross, take a knee, and worship Him. Because the good news of the gospel is that the gift of Christ is final. It's final. That's the distinguishment. That's the, what distinguishes Christianity from all other religions in the world. See, Islam says, man, do these five pillars, and if you do them well enough, maybe, just Maybe you'll spend eternity in heaven with Allah. Hinduism says, oh, do all of these sacrifices to appease the millions and millions of God so that life will go well for you. And even some of our Catholic friends still hold to the traditional Catholic doctrine that, yes, God made us alive with Christ, but now that we're made right before God, we have to do these things, otherwise we'll lose our withstanding before God. That's not good news. That's enslavement. We're still held captive to follow these laws, to follow these rules in order to earn our standing before God. That was part of the problem for the Colossians. That's what all of the, the next passage talks about. It says, don't let anyone judge you for having to do all of these things. You don't have to do all of those things. Jesus paid it all in full. That's why he died and cried out, it is finished. Because God's gift is final. And it's because of Christ. And I just want to pause there for a moment because maybe you're here today and you've, you've never done that. You've never fully received the gift that Christ has given. See, the girl in the video, she, she didn't do anything, but she received the gift. She didn't get up and run away and say, oh man, I'm not worthy to, to, to receive this. Or, or she didn't try to pay it back or herself. She received the gift. And friends, that's what we must do. We must respond to the gift that is offered. We must acknowledge our desperate need for Christ because of our sins that lead to death. And then we must believe in the cross of Christ, paying the debts that we owed Believing that he paid for them in full. And then resting in him. Just receive that gift. If you've never done that, I challenge, challenge you and urge you to do that today. You don't know how much longer we have. 
And even if you have done that, do it in a fresh way today. Remember how desperate we are for Christ's work in our lives. Be freed from this idea that I need to work and work and work to hold my standing before God. See, it's good news in acknowledging that God declares us spiritually dead without Christ, but then that God did something about it and gives us life with Christ and then calls it a done deal because God's gift is final because of Christ. And then this. So all of this, everything before this leading up to this one point, and it's this. God sets us free through Christ. That's it. Finishing it off in verse 15, it says, God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That's what this is all pointing to. This is why it's so important to see what Christ did. He freed us. He disarmed us from the rulers and authorities that we once were enslaved to. And what this is talking about, the rulers and authorities, it's not a literal idea of people who are in charge. No, God allows rulers and authorities in this world to still have some physical power now. Paul knew that. He knew that many before him, he himself, and many after and to this day would die martyrs' deaths to rulers and authorities who were evil. But what Paul says is an even better truth than that. It's the fact that the demonic forces were disarmed forever. For those who trust in Christ, their power no longer reigns in our lives. We've been set free. It's like this idea, the, the picture of this, this king coming back from battle, going around town with his warriors with him because he is, has triumphed victoriously over the enemy. He's done it. God's done it in Christ. A helpful way to think about this, put yourself in the position of an Old Testament believer. Someone who followed God, who believed God, who was looking forward to the day a Messiah would come to pay for the sins. Now, before Christ, anyone who died would go to Sheol, the resting place of the dead. A place separated from God, it was cold, dark, silent, and just waiting. Waiting for God to be true to his word and sending the Messiah to pay for the debt that they had. But they were waiting. They were enslaved. Waiting. But then one day, one day, Christ does come. He comes to the earth, God in the flesh. And then he does it. He dies the death that they owed but could not pay. And Jesus comes to them, rushes over, and rips Open the gates. They've been set free. The price has been paid. Those who believed God now get to spend eternity with God. Because Jesus disarmed the spiritual, demonic rulers and authorities. And now they stand in open shame as their prisoners are set free. And there's nothing that they can do about it. And Christ triumphs. That's it. That's what this is pointing to. And that's a reality for you and me, for those who are in Christ, who have trusted in him on the cross. So what does that mean practically? What it means practically is realizing that the sin that we still experience in this world does not hold us tightly. See, Satan still wants to, he, he, he cannot bound us 
by our sin any longer. That's no longer possible. But he can keep us ineffective. And so here's what it is. Make war against sin in your life. Make war against the sin in your life that Satan is trying to use to make you ineffective in the kingdom of God. But not just that, but make war with Christ. Knowing that he has already won the war. So enter into battle with Jesus at the front. Saying, God, please help me. Please help me to be victorious in conquering this temptation. Please help me to beat this sin. Please help me to be more loving, more patient, more merciful to the people around me. And when you fail, not if, when you fail, do fail, because time and time again we will. Do not hold that shame. No, run to God, who is quick to forgive and quick to give mercy. Be freed from the sin that is holding on to you and be freed from the guilt that lingers from it. That's good news. That's the good news that Paul has for the Colossians, and he has it for you and for me. And don't ever forget it. We have freedom in Christ. The truth is that God, yes, he declares the spiritually dead without Christ. Realize our desperate position before him. But that God did not, God did not keep us in that place. He did something about it. He gives us life with Christ. God did it. He made us alive. He forgave us our trespasses. But it's because how he did it, he did it by, by paying for the debt that, was, that we owed. And in doing so, God's gift is final because of Christ. We don't have to try to earn our way to God. We don't have to somehow pay him back in some regards. He's paid it all in full. And because of that, because we're no longer held by the bondage of sin, and because we're no longer held to the bondage of trying to work our way to God, God sets us free through Christ. And so realize this, it's not about the plurality of options that makes freedom so great. It's the fact that the best option is now available. God has made it available through Christ. And so let me invite you to that today, maybe for the first time, or maybe in a fresh way like never before. Ponder this. See what Christ has done for you and live in this ultimate freedom that all our souls long for the most.